Hi everyone. I just wanted to drop on before we get on into this episode on Elvis with Harriet Fletcher uh, to apologize. The sound quality isn't where I would have liked it. We clearly had some technical difficulties and Harriet's portion of the recording isn't as loud as we'd like. So I have tried to boost it where I can, but it's not ideal. And I just wanted to apologize. And I hope that you will bear with us on this one because the content of the episode is so rich and so interesting. Um, I did think we could redo the episode, but we were never going to hit the same points organically and naturally as we do in this. So I hope you can withstand that subpar quality and still enjoy the content. And hopefully Harry can come back on at some other point to do another episode with me. Uh, hope you enjoy. I'll speak to you later. Hello and welcome to Fats on Film. I am your host Hannah Ogilvy, and this is the podcast where we discuss all things fat representation in film, TV and wider media. This week I am joined by a contributor for Ghouls Magazine and a lecturer in media and communication at Anglia Ruskin University. It's Harriet Fletcher. Hello Harriet. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. Did you have a nice long weekend? I did. I went glamping, which was really exciting. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I went what? glamping on an island in Essex. On an island? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, my friend um, my friend uh, had, had a kind of posh work do. Um, she works at a law firm and they hired a, an island out in Essex and we, uh, we were, it was basically like a mini festival. Like, yeah, we were kind of glamping in those sort of posh tents um there was comedy there was like music it was just yeah it was it was an awesome way to spend the weekend just for this person's law firm yeah <laughs> how, how many people were there i think it's about 400 people whoa wow yeah <laughs> that's so cool was there was there any like named people like in the comedy tent or the best uh, uh, music tent there may, there may, I think it's mostly like small acts. I mean, yeah. There may, there may have been, but I was mostly <laughs> just, yeah, just having a good time. And then there was a kind of like a, a sort of cheesy pop disco at the end, uh, which I, I very much enjoyed. That I that's that sounds awesome. I love cheesy pop. I love a good dance. Yes, that sounds great. Oh, well that you've I think you've won the long weekend plan. <laughs> that that's amazing. I have nothing. I have nothing to compare to that. That's awesome. Oh, you've got great friends. <laughs> it was yeah. When she was like, "Do you want to come to this private island party with me?" I was like, <laughs> "Absolutely." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. It was it like an island in a in a lake, or was it like? It was like, so it was in, um, it was kind of off of Haybridge, which is in Essex, and you kind of have to drive along a causeway to get mm. to the island. So it's kind of, there's a, it's like a little bit of land with kind of where you have to kind of drive along or get a boat across. Yeah. Oh. It's a very small, it's a very small island. Uh, like yeah. Like a beachy bit. There was like a, it was mostly kind of sort of country fields. Um, there were donkeys there were peacocks it was a bit mad it was great oh my God, this, it just sounds bizarre I just feel like you've entered like a whole different world over the weekend <laughs> I know it feels you've like had to it. come back to reality yeah <laughs> were we going to talk about Elvis yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh well yeah you you I might I don't even know what I did over the weekend it's like it was all a bit of a blur but it was mainly work if I'm honest unfortunately but as I was just saying to you before we hit record I am going to Vienna at the end of this week so it's all good it's all yeah, good very exciting yes and it's going to be warm it's meant to be like 25 degrees and I'm like mm, oh, I'm nice. so ready for just like sun to like seep into my bones and reawaken me I'm done I'm done I'm done with with rain I need to live somewhere where it's just perpetually sunny yeah. <laughs> okay so Harriet we are here because we're gonna talk about Elvis so this is 2022 so this is my most recent film we've covered on this podcast so that's that's one accolade so 2022's elvis biopic directed by baz lerman i mean what can i say about baz lerman like an absolute notable director romeo plus juliet the great gatsby my favorite film of all time of moulin rouge written by there are four writers <laughs> on this film so you have sam brommel baz himself Craig Pierce, who he's worked with Baz on a load of his films, like like every film, and Jeremy Donner, and it stars Austin Butler, Tom Hanks, and Olivia De Jonge. I'm gonna say how you say her last name. I'm not too sure. 
It made $289 million at the box office, so an absolute success. And it was nominated for eight Oscars. Harriet, do you know what eight Oscars it was? Oof, no, I mean, definitely, it was definitely Best Actor, Best Film. Yeah, you're, yeah. I can imagine costume. Yes. And may, is, is like makeup, is that an Oscar? Uh-huh, makeup and hairstyling, absolutely. And you're you're so good, yeah. Director? No, Baz oh, was snubbed. Okay. Baz was snubbed. So you've got four out of the eight. Do you want to try any more? Um, is it, would it be original screenplay? No. Nope. Was it, oh, adapted screenplay? No. Nope. Ooh, okay. so the writer's got snubbed too. <laughs> oh, would it be, you know, supporting actor? No, we will oh, get into okay. that though. We will get into that. So the other four are best sound. Okay, yeah. Production design, cinematography, and film editing. Oh, oh yeah, it's big on the editing. It- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what Baz Luhrmann is isn't yeah. like he loves he loves a, a frenetic edit. Yeah, so uh, those those are the eight. Didn't win any of them. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, I feel quite bad because I remember, like, I don't know about you, Harry, but I'm a bit of an Oscars girly, and I remember going in. People were really um, going, "Oh, Elvis! Elvis could sweep." And it came out with nothing because everything ever yeah. all at once was the one that kind of sweeped. And oh no, maybe not all quite on the Western Front. That was more BAFTAs. I'm going to hand over to you now, Harry. Can you let us know all the synopsis for Elvis? Yes. Um, gosh, this is quite a challenge because the film is so comprehensive and it moves at 100 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, I mean, it's a biopic of. Elvis's life, so Elvis Presley, the you know famous iconic rock and roll star, and it kind of takes us right from the beginning to the end. So uh, we see Elvis as um, a young boy growing up in in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, we see him as a young musician who is starting out and doing kind of local gigs in um, in uh, Tennessee, and Louisiana. And there is one notable performance where he is kind of performing for um, an audience of of kind of mostly kind of young young women and kind of people in the area. And um, these people are mostly used to seeing these quite kind of stale, quite wholesome country and Western stars. And then Elvis comes on and he's bringing complete, you know, rock and roll vibes. He's kind of wiggling and shaking his hips and it, it drives um the kind of young female fans crazy um and this is something that they've kind of not seen before and they've not experienced before it was a real um phenomenon Mm -hmm. and um someone who happened to be there on that night was um colonel tom parker so colonel tom parker was um, a kind of self-styled music manager he was managing some of these more kind of stale country and western acts at the time And his background is he came from the kind of carnival circuit. So he's kind of a bit of a showman. And he kind of clocks Elvis and he thinks this is this is someone special. And also this guy's going to make me a lot of money. So he kind of um, takes Elvis under his wing and then eventually kind of pitches this idea to Elvis that, you know, I will manage you. I'll make you this global superstar. You'll be in Hollywood films. You'll be in Vegas and all of this. And Elvis accepts and then we see the trajectory of Elvis's career where he kind of goes to superstardom and he's performing um, all of these um, concerts with screaming fans and he's on TV and he's in films and he's in Vegas. Um, but we also see as this, this relationship progresses that this professional relationship is quite controlling, it's quite exploitative um, and probably leads to the premature death of Elvis as we can kind of see like later on in his life um, because the film goes right from the beginning to the end mm-hmm. yeah I think there's oh I've watched this film twice now once because you know it came out I find the story of Elvis infinitely fascinating and my partner is a massive Elvis fan and I watched it again for this podcast. And that ending, even though I know it's coming, really does hit you because I think it's very clear 
what Baz Luhrmann's point of view is yeah. and again we're going to get I want to get into that actually because Baz has really I'm going to call him Baz as if I know him I just yeah. like you know I'm at Baz <laughs> but, but Baz really positions Colonel Tom Parker as the villain of of the piece yeah. and there is a lot of conflicting real life testimony against that so Priscilla Presley is very was very vocal um at the time and even now um i say now well rest in peace actually she has just recently passed but during the uh publicity of of this film she again reiterated that she didn't think that tom parker was a bad man he in fact helped elvis made elvis who he is and i just find it very interesting because again i've listened to podcasts where they've gone into you know conspiracy theories around elvis really gone into like life and the life and death of elvis where Tom Parker is clearly the bad man. When you have, I guess my question is, before this film, did you have an opinion on on Elvis's life and how Elvis was treated? Or did, has this film helped form that for you? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I had never heard of Tom Parker until I watched this film. Mm-hmm. And I had no knowledge of Elvis's kind of, like, career situation, how he was managed. Um, so I, you know, I didn't grow up listening to a lot of Elvis's music. Um, you know, he wasn't kind of played very much. My parents didn't, you know, weren't mm. kind of fans of him, that kind of thing. Sure. So I think I didn't have that knowledge about him until this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the image of Elvis that we often have in our imagination, unless, you know, you, you, you're really big fans of him, is either the kind of like young, heartthrob who Mm -hmm. kind of drives female fans Mm, yes or it's the kind of fat elvis like Mm -hmm. elder elvis who allegedly died on the toilet i actually don't know yes yeah we'll get into that yeah so i think there's kind of like there's kind of two images of elvis very contrasting images that we have in the kind of cultural imagination and those oh, that's really kind of like my knowledge of him and mm-hmm. and all the only kind of knowledge I, I have of him is kind of filtered through pop culture like you know I remember references to him in comedies and in kind of cartoons growing up and that kind yeah of thing. so I think I actually had very little knowledge of Elvis um myself and this mm-hmm. film has really opened my eyes yeah uh, because I had no idea that um, he was kind of controlled and exploited in this way. Mm-hmm. I had mm-hmm. no idea that those, you know, that level of kind of control and exploitation probably, and, you know, overwork probably mm. led to his kind of drug addiction, probably led to his premature death. I mean, arguably. Um, and I thought that the, the the way that Baz creates that narrative, it made me think, and I think he deliberately does this, and I know why, because there's a reference to this in the film. But I think what he's, it really resonates with what we now know about Britney Spears. Oh, I'm so glad you made that connection because, again, I, I, I'm a massive Britney fan. Massive, massive, massive. I absolutely adore her. What are your feelings on Britney? Yeah, love her. Okay. I, icon completely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I and when I first watched this, um, which would have been oh, I guess last year sometime, um, I was really struck with how this story is told from the point of view of Colonel Tom Parker. So the film starts, uh, we're in nineteen ninety seven, we're in Vegas, and the aged uh, Colonel Tom Parker, played by Tom Hanks, has collapsed, and it's almost like he's on his deathbed and he's reflecting on his life and his legacy, and that's how we how we are told the story of Elvis, and we are meant to take Tom Parker as an unreliable nar- narrator because we hear him saying one thing, and yet on screen is a very different story. However. I couldn't help but think this is like telling a Britney Spears biopic from the point of view of her father, Jamie Spears. Mm, Yes. And and that doesn't sit right with me. Yes. This is something I've been thinking about as well. Like why on earth would they do this? Because on the one hand, um, you know, this feels, this feels kind of not right. It feels Mm -hmm. like you're giving a voice to the person who is, you know, the sort of abusive party in this relationship and the person who kind of, okay, made his career, but also destroyed it. But I think, 
I think I kind of understand maybe why it did it as well, because I think that if you um, frame the film through the lens of the, um, I guess, the kind of like um, the villain, the kind of abusive party, then it's a good way of kind of exposing them Mm. and kind of like and kind of showing the kind of unraveling of their facade and kind of exposing how sort of manipulative and delusional they are. Yeah. I think rather than rather than framing the film in a sort of objective way it kind of makes me think a bit of have you ever read lolita or you no i haven't story? no i i, I obviously of... know of it i haven't read it yeah because that's um i mean very different topic but it's mm. about um it's kind of narrated by a, a pedophile who is kind of mm-hmm. talking about his relationship with a, a young girl and he's kind of framing it as if like it's all you know consensual and, mm. and, fine, and it's kind of great romance but in um framing it from his perspective it's a really interesting way of kind of allowing us to kind of pick holes in him yes yeah totally and I do I do hear that in and and I and I do think it works to a certain extent because you get that real juxtaposition between what we are being told and then what we are seeing there's a really good moment where um it's it's when Elvis is now performing in in the Vegas residency like he started the Elvis residency, like or like so the Vegas residency, which is something Britney would then go on to do. Like the yeah. the parallels are maddening to me, and um. So yeah, there's a scene, and uh, you know, he's he's being <laughs> pursued by all of these uh, female fans who are just lusting after Elvis, and Tom catches Priscilla's eye, and he he says something like. Um, or she could tell that she could never compete with the love of his fans. But actually, my reading is she sees right through Tom Parker and she's actually judging him for because they want to go travel the world in this moment and he's the one keeping them in in the states and it's interesting like tom tom is like convinced himself that he is the good guy he is elvis's savior even in that moment where it's very clear to us as an audience that no one else around Elvis thinks Tom is their savior and so I I hear from from your point of view like it it does give us the opportunity to pick holes in his narrative um I just I really hope that uh whenever we do get the Britney biopic it's not told from Jamie's point of view because I'm just thinking like the man doesn't deserve a platform yeah. Um, and I and I guess as well, I'm also struck with this idea of Elvis isn't here to defend himself. So mm-hmm. if we hear it from Tom's par- point of view, like he is the survivor of all of this relationship, he can spin it in whatever way he wants. And you know that that phrase of like a history is written by the winners, it felt very like that. And I guess in some ways we should be thankful that there's so much documented evidence for Elvis's. Um, point of view because he was in the spotlight we have um, the media we have other people who were like part of the business dealings that were happening to to poke holes in Tom's uh, story and his financial abuse of Elvis and and the um, Presley uh, family you know and that's again that's another thing that they really go in deepest about it's not Colonel, Colonel Tom Parker's victim isn't just Elvis it was his whole family yes. and on this rewatch, I was struck with uh, how Elvis is almost like a victim, not just of Tom Parker, but of like his family's lack of like spine. And that might sound really harsh, but watching his dad just be an absolute doormat really angered me. Yeah, yes, definitely. And I think in a way, this might be, because potentially because they're kind of you know they're not particularly like well-off family they're yeah. kind of humble working class people and I think maybe they're people who are kind of vulnerable to being exploited especially yes. if they're getting financial gain from it and that's something yeah. that Elvis um kind of says very early on when when um the colonel says he wants to manage him and he wants to give him this fantastic career Elvis just says you know I just want to make sure my family um are kind of looked after and yeah I I do think that kind of makes them more vulnerable and yeah yeah completely and then you know the bit where um they're all kind of gathered around signing the initial contract Mm. for Elvis Presley Enterprises and then 
the colonel says to the dad, I can't remember his name, um, oh, you know, you can be the business manager. And he's kind of just like, oh, okay. Like it, they kind of, he's kind of putting all of this pressure onto people who don't have the experience that mm-hmm. he has, or maybe, you know, he doesn't even really have a lot, a huge amount of experience, but he kind of pretends he does. Yes. He's, yeah, he's putting a lot of kind of pressure on these people. And I think it's also incredibly sad when, um, kind of later on in the film Elvis collapses from exhaustion mm. and then this you know people kind of gather around him and there's a, a lady who says you know if he was my son I'd be mm-hmm. taking him to hospital mm-hmm. and then the colonel kind of not he doesn't really push too much but it's sort of implied that he has this kind of like power over um, Elvis's father to make this decision about what to do with Elvis at that mm-hmm. point in time and the father um kind of says okay like what what kind of drugs can you give him we need to get him back on stage and and then you know the his relationship with his dad seems to deteriorate later on in the film um as kind of Elvis kind of just um kind of falls more into addiction and Mm. it is yeah I think I think the relationship that Elvis has with his family is quite sad I think he loses a lot he loses a lot over the course of the film Mm -hmm. by getting closer to Tom and by allowing Tom to kind of control his life yeah a hundred percent like it, the parallels between like uh you know a domestically violent relationship and what's happening here between tom and elvis is is it's very clear you know uh tom tom is is so manipulative and it's interesting because i did do a little bit of research into how accurate the uh the colonel tom parker representation is and there are conflicting again conflicting points um he absolutely was manipulative, financially abusive, all those things. But he's not as this is from a Vanity Fair article from October twenty twenty two. I'll link it in um in my Instagram stories so people can find it. But it was this a woman who I'm blanking on her name, but she'd met him um various different times during the nineties just to get his side of the story. And she said one of the things about him is like Tom Hanks's portrayal is very um, almost like cartoonish villainy. Yeah. And, and again, I think the reason why we're even talking about Elvis on this podcast is because Tom Hanks is in a fat suit for the entirety of the runtime, which I think adds to that um, cartoonish villainy because in my opinion, it is not a good, fat, I don't think any fat suits are good, but his is particularly caricature-like. Um, and 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 this woman was saying like he wasn't like that. He was like so manipulative. To, he you know completely believed his own lies. He wasn't this like, um you know walking caricature of walking into like a studio with the with the Christmas jumper on as he's portrayed in the film. He was a lot more smarter. Even um the headlines that Elvis was getting because of his um because of his performing style very similar to the black artists of the time that's what he that's where who he was influenced by and obviously during the segregation times of the united states that was a big no-no you can't have a a white guy looking like a black guy on tv the the film portrays that as if um uh tom parker doesn't like that but that's not true if anything he loved the headlines because it garnered you know that the saying like you know even bad publicity is still good publicity so that they try to paint him as this um, again this very manipulative wants to clip Elvis's wings person which to a point he was but the film goes that extra step to really convince you of the fact and I mean I get it's a film and I guess all biopics have to have some kind of um, uh, you know they, they, they take influence from real life and that might not be a direct direct comparison uh, but there is a real obviousness i think to the colonel tom parker's villain or antagonist of the story which in from my opinion and reading also other people's and um, like critics opinions and also the award season's opinions uh tom hanks was not revered for this role in fact i read i think again it was in vanity or variety one of the v's uh, they called it his worst role to date gosh yeah and I, okay. And people love Tom Hanks. Yeah. I actually saw a really funny letterbox review of this role, of this film. Mm. Where because because this this film was produced during the pandemic. Yes, it was. The beginning, and Tom Hanks was one of the first, I guess, A listers to uh get coronavirus. Yeah, he was. And someone said um the coronavirus must have got into his brain. That's the only <laughs> way of it. <laughs> 
that is the only way of explaining what he's doing here. It's 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 really <laughs> odd. I mean, this is like this is a man who has been on our screens ever since we've been alive, Harriet. Right? Yeah. And you know, and the thing is, I don't think he does much variety in his performances now as he did when he was younger. But you know, like he's older, he just gets he's getting comfortable. But for me, this de- this role is definitely outside of his comfort zone from what he's been doing in the past. I don't know, maybe ten years, and it is bizarre. And I think he was trying to benefit from this idea that, like you know, um, your casual viewers like yourself, Harriet, who might not have known Elvis's story, who wouldn't know who Tom Parker was. But from my understanding of people who do know who Tom Parker was, it's he wasn't like this. So even his accent, so his accent's this odd. Um, I saw I saw one person call it like a Nazi esque accent. Oh no! Uh, and uh, and Colonel Tom Parker was originally from the Netherlands, but. Um, I have watched interviews with him. He spoke with a pretty American accent. The only differences he had were he would say um, his his R's would sometimes come out as L's. So he used to say like Mr. Plesley instead of Mr. Presley. And he would also, there was another one. Oh, K, uh, J's would come out as l's or something so it would be like you you lust missed him instead of you just missed him so it almost came across as like a speech impediment and that's why no one really clocked the fact he wasn't an american citizen until much later in his life the film makes out like this is a big twist for elvis when he finds out oh the reason why he's not allowed to tour the world is because he doesn't have a valid american passport Elvis had no idea. He died never knowing that that's why he wasn't allowed to travel. And it wasn't until the 80s did they actually find out that he's he's Dutch. So, and the reason because his voice, he just sounded like he had a speech impediment. But the film is just like, again, it comes back to this cartoon villainry thing where it's like, I mean, again, I'm, I'm trying to think, is it Hollywood saying that like German accented, accented bad guys, you know? <laughs> They're like it's just our default you know they're either, either british or they're german accented and that's the only villains we can have in film <laughs> yeah potentially i think there is a def- i'm so pleased you brought on the sort of cartoonishness of it because that's something i was definitely thinking yeah when i was watching and the sort of caricatured nature of it i think it's i wonder if because a question i've had and i think you've had as well is like why cast tom hanks in this yes I, absolutely I because he's done a bit of like, um, you know, animated work, voice work. Mm. I suppose to some extent there is a cartoonishness about him and that he kind of brings mm. that to roles. And I wonder if the, the film wanted to bring that out in the character and wanted kind of Tom Hanks to kind of, to, to, to kind of for that. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, why? Because, um you know, he is, he is the villain, he's a bad character, he's very exploitative, he's, you know, very controlling. But when we portray that kind of person in quite a caricatured, cartoonish way, it does it, does it kind of um, mean that we don't take that character as seriously as we should? Mm. Um, and I think as well, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot going on with caricaturing of this character, I mean, beyond the accent, I mean, the fat suit is the obvious thing. Yeah, and um, I think I wonder if it's kind of playing into the sort of Hollywood shorthand of, um, the, you know, kind of this this feature equals villain. So like, yeah, this accent equals villain, or you know, um, fat equals villain, or you know, the kind of the Bond films do this all the time. Like, yes, facial, facial disfigurement equals villain. Yes, it's like the audience need to know that there's this person is kind of other in some way. And uh huh they are a villain and we, we're not meant to like them so I wonder mm-hmm. if like that the, Tom Parker is this kind of like caricature of other character mm-hmm. in the way that he's kind of being portrayed as a villain mm-hmm. yeah I, I think when I google pictures of him there's not many pictures of Tom Parker it has to be said uh, but I wanted to get like a comparison and he absolutely was a bigger man 100% no doubt about it but the problem when we have fat suits is that there's something so uncanny valley about them. And with Tom Parker's fat suit and Elvis, so obviously he's got the body suit on. But the most jarring thing for me is his neck 
area and then the face and then this nose that they've given him and it just looks like rubber like uh, there's some close-ups where you can just see like how badly like the foundation is laying on top of the prosthetics it's uh, it's 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 it really takes you out of it and it's almost like removes any humanity that this character has or or this real life person i guess that's the other thing i'm struck by this is a real person i'm not in any way defending tom parker because by all accounts even if the presley family have come out in defense of him that there was enough lawsuits and enough evidence to show he was absolutely financially abusing the hell out of out of the presleys but like he's still a human and his actions alone should make him the villain but they had they went to such extremes to make almost a mockery of of this character like say remove any of the humanity obviously they don't talk at all about his family life and again i'm not saying they should because it's like oh you know how much of a backstory do you need to know for your villains but it's it's like they (laughs) maybe there's a happy medium but they're so off the other end of it so when I was reading about this film, this film first started to- being talked about in Hollywood at 2014, and it was in what they like to call development hell. So this is when they just cannot get the film, you know, can't get backers, can't get anyone to sign on to it. The script is going through rewrites and rewrites and rewrites until eventually Tom Hanks signed on in 2019. And that's what got it out of this development hell. That's when they started auditioning. Oh, God. On that note. I actually really like Austin Butler in this. I think he's a. I think he's very good. Um, again, I saw some criticisms of him where they don't think he's charismatic or doesn't have the same charisma that real life Elvis had. And I'm like, yeah, but like Elvis Presley was like once in a blue moon. I think Austin Butler does a really good job here. Uh, I really liked. I really like his performance. Um, so yeah, they started auditioning for Elvis at this point when Tom Hanks came on. Other notable aud- auditionees were Miles Teller, which I can totally see the resemblance of, and Harry fucking Styles. Of course, yeah. <laughs> oh, just, no! He's going to throw his hat in the ring for everything. I've just... <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind about the acting career of Harry Styles. I really am. I just... I, I mean, in some ways, it feels so much like Elvis, where like they're just throwing him into films because they know it's going to bring money in. Like, I don't know that the parallels there are really funny, but I just I can't I can't stand it. I can't stand to see this man in more films. The man cannot act. Go to school. Stick to singing. That's 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 plenty fruitful, you know. Um. So, Austin Butler gets gets the role because he submits an audition tape, which, uh, Baz Luhrmann says it almost was like a breakdown. Um, so I think Austin has said that he um, did did his first audition, but it felt like almost like an Elvis impersonation, and he was a bit, a bit embarrassed by it. So then he then um, came away and recorded himself singing. I can't remember which Elvis song it it was. It might have been "Love Me." Oh no, it was "Unchained Melody." It was "Unchained Melody," but he sang it from the perspective of a son singing it to his mother. Because Austin lost his mother when he was 23, the same age Elvis lost his mother. So he had this like kinship with Elvis. And I was, I, I'm assuming he got very, very emotional. So it sounds like it was a very emotional pull point. And Baz is like, this man's having a breakdown. I need to meet him. And then that was it. That that was that was Elvis for them. So Tom Hanks signing on really causes all of this chain reaction for this film to eventually get made during the pandemic, as you said. <sighs> but does that mean like Tom Hanks was the right person to play the role of Colonel Tom Parker? Yeah, I mean, I'm pleased you explained that because something I wondered was like, is the only reason Tom Hanks is in this because they needed an A-list to push it? Yeah. And it seems like they did. No, they 100% did. They 100% because again, I didn't know Austin Butler before before this film. My understanding is he was in a relationship with Vanessa Hudgens for like 10 years and I know who she is. I didn't know who he was. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah. And, the, and the rest of the cast are all like Australian actors and, you know, tend to work with Baz Luhrmann quite a lot. So you've got Richard Roxenborough from Moulin Rouge, is what I know him from. You've got David Wenham, who's been, in, again, a very notable Australian actor, but they're not. You've got Cody Smith, Smith McPhee, which again, 
isn't going to be pulling in major people just yet maybe one day but he's still quite young so yeah i think that's the, that was one of the problems like who's going to go see this elvis film because no one knows who anyone is ah tom, tom hanks is top build which makes sense yeah. but it's called elvis it should be austin butler yeah yeah it's a bit of a mix it's a bit of a mix up in terms of like you know who's the main character who are we meant to be kind of back in like who's who should be telling this story um yeah i did think that the only reason tom hanks is in it is surely because they needed an a-lister mm -hmm. i'd be interested to know like who else auditioned for it and you know i was thinking as well like because i'm a Baz Luhrmann fan as well and Love. i would have i would have watched this film if there was like a lesser known actor in that role Yes, I would have. T I I totally would have done too because of Baz Luhrmann. Yeah, like he's got such an interesting style of filmmaking, and we actually haven't talked about that. But the way this film this film is filmed, or or how it's at least portrayed on screen, is so interesting because it's so. And I say this with respect, but wacky. Mm. You know, you have the iconography every time we go into a new place um we've you know it'll say something like you know beale street when we when we first get to beale street the production design is awesome it really feels incredibly bright and interesting and especially especially when you get to uh beale street and like club handy like i can totally understand why elvis would be pulled there because it looks like that's just where people are living and then and then you got all these edits you have these weird cgi transitions when we go from like a roulette table to something else and it's just it's just a bit mad but i wouldn't expect anything less from baz because that's his style and like you say that's enough of a pull for me mm. and, and i think as well the subject matter i think the subject matter is interesting elvis has got a very interesting story which has strong parallels to a very similar icon is going through something very similar to today's world which is Britney Spears I think it's a story that needs to be told but I don't know why Tom Hanks had to be part of it yeah um yeah I mean yeah totally like I, I I've sort of been thinking like if they'd cast um a lesser known actor in that role how different the film would be and you know would that would it mean that that character was sort of taken more seriously would it mean that they were like less caricatured and especially if they'd have actually cast a fat actor and not had that clumsy fat suit. Mm. Um, and I'm completely with you on, on the fat suit. It actually made me think, and this is such an insult to Baz Luhrmann, I don't mean it to be, because I gen generally love him, but it kind of made me think <laughs> a bit of like Austin Powers. It was kind of like mm. that level of like almost sort of like comedic, caricatured, very clumsy fat suit. Yeah. Um, with a kind of like comedy nose. Sort of yes. 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 Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's a really good, like, you know, similar to, like, Fat Bastard and Austin Powers. Absolutely. Just, and I, I think as well, I, I'm, I'm really struggling because Tom Parker was a big man, so he should be fat. But there is something so grotesque in the fat suit's use here, and I cannot help it, it be a representation of Tom Parker's greed and corruption. So that's a really common fat stereotype we see in a film. Um, straight off the back, I've gone Stellan Scars Garden Dune. Like, you know, it, it, not comically, because that's not fair, but, you know, unrealistically big, um, to the point where like his you can't you can barely see Stellan's face in Dune, right? It, it, I don't know how the man is acting through all of that prosthetics. But his character there is this corrupt, greedy, opulent, warlord type figure. Or, yeah, like, um, conqueror type, yeah? And then you have the same here with Tom Parker. You know, he is incredibly greedy. His morals are dubious at, at best. That's probably saying it very politely. And again, when we, when we talk about um, gluttony as a deadly sin... Um, but yeah, it's this idea like, you know, you're you're religiously bad because you're eating too much. And I and I and the thing is I'm really in my head and two minds about it because he was big, but it also it's just done in such an extreme way in the film that it really uh, is the physical embodiment of all these negative qualities that Tom Parker has. Yes. Yeah, completely. I think it's that kind of 
I suppose quite outdated Hollywood shorthand of like yes um, absolutely fat equals greedy or you know this character Mm -hmm. is kind of greedy they're immoral and therefore they need to be kind of uglified in some way I think this is a film over the years where a character who's kind of morally corrupt in some way needs to be in some way physically ugly for us to kind of understand that yeah Um, so I think there's a kind of uglification of Tom Parker that's definitely manifesting in the form of fatness Uh and I kind of wondered as well with his the fatness okay we know that the the real person in in real life was was fat Uh but I think there's a kind of almost theatrical fatness and I wondered if this is part of Baz Luhrmann's whole aesthetic because I find from Baz Luhrmann's films that he's really interested in sort of like theatre and Mm -hmm. uh, kind of you know burlesque and cabaret and Mm -hmm. and that kind of like aesthetic look of the films and like is Tom Parker part of that because we've got the whole sort of carnival angle of this film and how, you know, he came from the carnival and he sees Elvis as not really a musician, but more as like a carnival act that's kind of making him money. Exactly. He calls him an attraction multiple times throughout the film. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, this might be a bit far-fetched, but are we meant to see... Are we meant to see the Colonel and his fatness as almost like a kind of like freak show type? Yeah character like is that yeah. what's going on with the fatness and the kind of excess and the gluttony that is a fascinating take and I don't disagree with you so again re- reading on the real life Tom Parker he absolutely loved a carnival um so there are m- multiple anecdotes of when he was driving you know Elvis around the country and probably in like the late 50s at this point in the, in the timeline whenever there was like a carnival sign or a um quote-unquote freak show sign he absolutely had to stop and go and see it um because he was just fascinated by the whole carnival lifestyle the attractions um he loved it so it would make sense if like he himself was also one of those carnival attractions and again the in these anecdotes they said that he was really obsessed with the film uh nightmare alley from i think it's 1947 which guillermo del toro recently remade mm. um he he loved that film because it was like a representation of like his lifestyle that he he used to have you know so i think that's a really good reading that he himself is part of this you know the, the sideshow freaks um you know again I, if you look at, back at like the freak show history yeah plus size big people where were you know included especially big women because obviously the idea of like women meant to be dainty and overtly feminine and of course femininity can only be portrayed in in thinness you know um so you got plus size women you have women plus size women with beards if you think about your the image of the bearded lady in your head they're usually bigger yeah. so th- yeah there's absolutely something going on there but it's interesting where he he himself has managed to break away from the freak show element i just want to point out to the listeners i am using air quotes whenever i say freak show yeah. <laughs> i know i know it's not i know it's very outdated language um but yeah um so it's like he's made able to like elevate out of that and he's become the manager of it you know and and maybe there's a sense of uh, projection on his point of view because he projects his insecurity over being this freak show act onto Elvis so makes Elvis one because Elvis is everything Tom Parker isn't right Elvis is actually talented and there's a there's another uh, when Tom Parker's trying to explain himself on the film he says that you know he deserved that 50% cut he got from Elvis's uh Elvis's gigs because he was also working super hard he thought he was doing 50% of the work and I quickly googled like you know what do music managers tend to get it's about 15 to 20% they would get off a cut so he is like yeah almost doubling what he should be getting from Elvis but he truly believes he deserves it where he doesn't he isn't actually doing any the same level of work as what Elvis is doing um Elvis is incredibly attractive. He's like luring the ladies to him. They, you know, they can't help themselves. You know, there's that, that scene that you mentioned earlier, the Louisiana hayride or something like that. 
and the women that cannot control themselves at the sight of this man who's wiggling his pelvis at them and uh you know you know those women aren't aren't screaming like that for tom parker yeah <laughs> you know like so is there a bit of jealousy there and so he has to control it. he has to he has to make himself integral to his success so he can like he's riding on the coattails all the way to the bank all the way to the casino to the point where he fully believes he's entitled to it yeah and there's that conversation they have together i think it's kind of kind of near the end of the film where um elvis confronts him about i think maybe about his sort of lack of passport and oh, that yeah. kind of lies and i think tom says something like you know you need me as much as I need you. Yes. It's that kind of like relationship between them that, that well, that, that Tom suggests they kind of like feed from each other and they gain from each other. Yes, a hundred percent. He is, I, Elvis says in that confrontation, your fat goddamn face. Oh, really? I missed mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Elvis says that to Tom. I wrote that down. And again, it's this, <laughs> you see it, all the time all the time in films i was literally watching i've started watching the fast and furious franchise i thought we've got to the 10th one let's give it a go (laughs) i've never seen any of them before any of them so we've watched too fast too furious over the weekend and there is a scene where um mark boone jr is playing like this corrupt miami cop and he comes in and they're going to uh scare him into submission so they do they do what the bad man says so paul walker and tyrese gibson can get away with some money that's the bare bones of the plot of that film (laughs) there's barely a plot of that film (laughs) Um, i had a great time and um in in order to do that they're going to put a rat on mark's belly and then put a bucket over the rat and then put start put a flame on the bucket so the rat would bury into mark's body it's really quite dark for a chill fast and furious film um in doing this when they kind of rip off his shirt to get to his belly they say, um, uh, "Take off, take off your, sh- um, take off your sh- the shirt, you fat fuck, or something like that." Now, these throwaway lines are in almost every film. It's wild. Again, I watched the Hot Chick over the weekend. Rob Schneider's the Hot Chick. I love Anna Faris so much. So you know, I'll I'll watch whatever she's in. Terrible film, incredibly racist. I can't believe it ever got made. But there's, again, throwaway lines of just fatness, fat phobia, oh, you're fat, oh, you're fat, gross fat, ugly fat, everywhere. And so as much as this film really has a you know, fat person in the centre of the story and he is, it is commented on, in every other film, there is a comment on fatness at some point. And that brings me to my next question, which is, why do we use fat suits well i think the simple answer is hollywood or well and maybe kind of wider film in general has an issue with representation and diversity Mm -hmm. and for some reason doesn't want to hire fat actors Mm -hmm. or maybe um it's something that goes right back to kind of, I don't know, drama schools, maybe like fat actors aren't given as many opportunities to flourish there. So mm-hmm. therefore like um, they don't kind of progress um, mm-hmm. as much. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think, it, I think it's got to be a representation issue. Um, and as well, I mean, you know, I read a couple of interviews with Austin Butler where he was talking about, because he wears a fat suit at some point in the film, which he I does. assume is right at the end when he, um, performs the Unchained Melody mm. um, song um, and he was t- sort of talking about how he found it really uncomfortable and he could barely breathe in it and that he also had to do this quite high energy um, mm-hmm. musical number and act and it almost seems you know is it kind of unethical to make actors wear them mm. because you know if it's really that difficult to perform in it why mm. have them do it why not just kind of you know make more room for fat actors mm-hmm. um Something actually, I feel, I mean, I could be wrong on this, but just based on my my knowledge, I feel like actors don't talk about fat suits in a serious way enough. Mm. There's not enough kind of interviews about what it's like to wear one, how they're made, 
what kind of training is involved in mm. having to perform in one so I don't mm. I think in a way it's almost like it's kind of it seems like a negative thing like oh I had to wear this fat suit oh it was so you know it was so awful it was such an ordeal it was so uncomfortable but like I'd like to know a bit I'd, I'd personally like to know a little bit more about like what's actually involved um and also I guess you know there is the question of like is it yeah is it a kind of ethical to make acts wear them if it's if it's so kind of physically demanding it's a really really awesome question because I've never thought it from from that point of view like comfortability because if you go on to any um, IMDb trivia page of any film where they have a fat suit, there will always be a trivia point of how long it took the actor to get into that fat suit every single time. So, for example, it took Tom Hanks five hours to get into the prosthetics needed to portray Tom Parker. Um, my last episode I recorded was on Seven, and in order to play the victim of gluttony it took the actor I think it was like eight or nine hours to get into the prosthetics of that these are full working days yeah. before you've even started the work yeah. so if, you're right from an ethical point of view you're spot on actually like it, is it ethical to make people sit there and I as you were talking it reminded me of the, the um what Jim Carrey said about playing the Grinch he found getting put into that Grinch costume so torturous. He actually learned um, interrogation techniques from FBI people to help him get through it because he found it so like intensely stimulating. Mm. That's not fun. Yeah, <laughs> and I, absolutely. And I wonder if, if I mean, again, not related, but kind of not. Um, have you have you watched The American Office? um bits of it but not not loads okay so angela uh, angela kinsey and jenna fisher who play pam and angela on the office they are best friends in real life and they have a podcast called the office ladies where they're re-watching every episode i love it um but they have all spoken how each of their characters in the show have ha have been pregnant and so they've had to wear the fake bellies and they have spoken at length of how uncomfortable these fake pregnant bellies are to wear and how difficult it is to go to the bathroom with them. So as you were talking, I'm like, hold on, how do you even go to the bathroom in these fat suits? Yeah. You know, like, in, you know, with, 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 with those actresses, you know, that's a that's a belly. Um, <laughs> so if you've got a full on, you know, prosthetic fat suit on with, with, with um, you know, the makeup the, the jowls in, in in tom hanks's case you know how are you drinking how are you eating like what is the actual effect of being in a fat suit every day so your first point is it ethical i'd love to know it's like it's ethical it's clearly not comfortable because people are sp at least speaking out to that point um Brendan Fraser has spoken out at length about his fat suit for The Whale, a film we will talk about on this podcast, but I'm emotionally not ready to do that yet. Um, he, But he has spoken about how going into the fat suit for playing Charlie, who is a 600 pound man, like it helped him get into the character because of the, the actual weight of the suit. Mm -hmm. So I think some actors view it as almost like a portal into the character they're playing, which I'm I'm not going to disagree with. I understand the logic behind that. But again, it must be fucking heavy, <laughs> you know? Like, how, how, how confining is that? I can imagine being quite claustrophobic to a point as well. And then ultimately, to the, the last bit, you well, not last bit, but the big point that you mentioned, representation. So I think we have two issues which you've already identified, which is the pipeline into it. So do we have um, actors who are in larger bodies actually coming through the pipeline of drama school, into auditions, into films, into TV? And if they are coming, are they being cast or not? And it, it, we have the same issue with them. Um, they talk about this with female directors that there's not many female directors going into film school to begin with because it's seen as such a boys club. It's not seen as accessible to them. It's not seen as um, something they're allowed to do because of the lack of representation already in it. So you have this like chicken and egg situation where, well, someone has to be the first, but being the first, I, was, I spoke about this um, recently with representation. 
to represent something which is a very uh, which is an area which has got very little representation that looks similar to you so you maybe you're the first or maybe you're one of very few people means you have to be incredibly vulnerable you're putting yourself into a space that currently does not welcome you and that requires a lot of strength a lot of self-confidence patience determination and I'm sure a lot of people go into those spaces being like, yeah, no, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then they get kicked out again because they can't keep up with it. They're going to, you know, um, I want to say bullied, bullied out of it, which in no way makes it right. I'm just hypothesizing this issue. Now, I'm only saying that because um, one of my things I do, again, I have like two audiences where I have my like film audience and I also have my fashion audience. And on TikTok, I do plus size fashion. And it's going really, really well. But I get shit on by trolls. Luckily, I'm in a space in my life where I can go, it's all good. I, I you know, I, I I know what I'm doing. You're sadly projecting. That's not, that's not my problem. But if I didn't have this self-confidence and I didn't have this determination, those comments would get to me because they're hella nasty. So if you're a fat person going to drama school, somewhere that maybe you're not accepted or you're not welcomed or you're not being represented and you get bullied or you don't get the parts you want or you're um, unfairly oppressed, you know? Again, you always hear those ideas of like never getting picked for the lead because your your face or your body didn't fit the lead role. You might give up and I wouldn't blame you for that. But it means at the end of the pipeline, there's fewer fat actors to choose from from a casting director point of view so we'll just get Tom Hanks, we'll just get Colin Farrell, we'll just get Brendan Fraser and put them in a fat suit. Yeah, yeah, completely. I think, you know, um, as you say, you have to kind of make yourself vulnerable in order to kind of potentially like um, make any kind of changes and kind of unities that you want and deserve and there must be a lot of actors who have to be incredibly resilient, perhaps more yes. than the average person. And Definitely. Have certainly have to work harder than mm -hmm. the average kind of straight size actor. Um, and I suppose even if they do kind of break through, are they going to be represented in a way that is kind of fair? Like, mm. you know, they might drift into kind of typecast type roles, like potentially, I would say, arguably, like Rebel Wilson, for example. Really good point. Um, so, and then there's the question of like, is any representation better than none? Mm. Like, should you should you kind of do those roles to make a name for yourself, and then try and kind of change roles for yourself in like a producer role? Um, you know, kind of make the films that you and make the, the kind of representations that you want to see. Um, it's a tough one. It's a very tough one. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's like, you know, should we be thankful for any representation? But there is positive and then there is negative representation. So if you look at like fat representation from, I'm going to say the noughties more specifically, just because it's it's more in my head. But there is always a teen, a teen comedy in the early noughties. The fat character is the laughing stock. To use your word, uglified, um... It's meant to be like a joke that a character finds them attractive. That isn't good representation mm. because the reality then becomes, um, you know, you, you you watch that as a child, you watch that as a teenager, you are being told, oh, because you're in a bigger body, if anyone fancies you, it's a joke because yeah. you are so unfanciable. And then on the on that, to go that even a little bit further, People do do it as jokes because they've seen it in TV and film. And, it's you know, they say, like, oh, like, you know, um, people people don't copy what they see in film and TV because if they did, then, you know, they watch Mission Impossible, they hang out of planes. I'm like, yeah, they're not going to do that. What they do is very subtle. It's subtle yeah. representation. It's things that they can do in their everyday life. And it does lead to bullying. It does lead to, um, I mean yeah <laughs> ter ter terrible treatment of others it, that is the reality of poor representation in real life the other thing I want to talk about 
with fat suits is I think there's a moral dilemma within Hollywood. I have nothing to base this on. I don't know how to preface this, but this is just my theory. I think Hollywood has found itself in a really difficult position where it's being told constantly needs to be representing more, but there is this real deep rooted stigma and stigma and uh, and belief that being fat is bad that being fat is unhealthy so i think there's a moral dilemma where hollywood go okay well, we've got to have fat characters because that's what we're meant to be doing but we can't hire fat actors because it will look like that we're promoting an unhealthy lifestyle now i want to I know if you dig deeper into that theory, then you could go, well, why do they ask actors to lose weight, gain weight? Surely that's unhealthy too. They ask them to smoke. Surely that's unhealthy too. I agree. But where fatness is so linked to morality, I think it's it's going to take a long time for them to untie that or unravel that. So I think it finds itself into this point where like, there are a few fat actors who have broke through it uh, and, and they just get cast for every fat role. And I'm looking at Melissa McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, completely. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, really like her and I'm so glad she's success- as as successful as she should be. But there are, I know there are more fat actresses that are desperate for their, for their voice, you know, for their, for their time in the spotlight. Um, But they, I think, again, they pat themselves in the back going, oh, we let one through. But then for every other fat role, they just, oh, just throw a fat suit in. Ah. <sighs> I think as well, like, going back to, like, linking back to Tom Parker, the use of fat suits really takes away humanity, away from the role. And we mentioned, like, maybe hiring Tom Hanks, you know, you get that A-list pool, you get people in seats, because, oh, it's another Tom Tom Hanks film, let's go, let's go. I barely recognise Tom Hanks in this film. The Batman, Colin Farrell as Penguin unrecognizable unrecognizable to the point where like well what's the point what is the point and uh, no disrespect to Colin Farrell I think he's a very good actor but not in that performance because I barely see him you know half the point of acting I mean don't get me wrong obviously like voice acting does exist but like you can see them struggling to show an an emotion through the layers of rubber on their face even like around their eyes and it's interesting because when I do really want to talk about Austin Butler's fat suit and Elvis because I have a very different opinion on that um but when he is wearing one you can see like they've really padded up his eyes you can barely see his eyes and I guess you to what you were saying in that interview he was saying how hard it is to act through all that but in Elvis's situation I wouldn't have thought it was it would be ethical for them to ask Austin Butler to gain weight to portray an older, bigger Elvis. I would have thought that 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 doesn't sit well with me either. So I understand the use of the fat suit in this very specific situation. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I think that I think that the Elvis fat suit. First of all, I think it makes kind of logical sense in the yeah. narrative because we see, you know, like we know that Elvis puts on weight later in his life and mm-hmm. the whole film is portraying the whole trajectory of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of makes logical sense. And as you say, yeah, it's, you know, like, it doesn't sit right with me that actors are celebrated for putting on weight and losing weight for roles. And I think no. this would be too much for someone, to, too much to ask of someone. Mm. Um, so I think that fat suit makes sense yeah I do too it and I do think that that Unchained Melody scene uh, after what you've watched in the entire film it is quite an emotional scene oh oh, no I love the final scene Harriet like I really really do I that's what I said at the very beginning where like that is a real gut punch for me because first of all they're very clever where they start off with Austin Butler portraying Elvis and it just, um, again, from the 1968 special onwards, they they blend Austin and Elvis's real vocals to kind of combine the two. And I think it really works because, again, you know, I think Austin was like 32 when this came out and he's not going to sound like an older 
I say this with love Elvis, raggedy <laughs> Elvis, who is, you know, God bless him, highly, highly in that pit of um, pill addiction. And I think they made sense to blend the voices. So, so you have um, Austin's Elvis start singing Unchained Melody. It's this powerhouse in performance. And if anything, you, you, I mean, I didn't actually watch the Oscars in its entirety this year, so I don't know what they used as their, you know, their little um, postcards where they go, and the nominations are, and they go through, and Austin Butler for the Elvis. Um, I hope they use that, though, because that is the moment where you're like, this is this is good. Yeah. Um, it's really heartbreaking. And then it cuts to the real life footage of that performance with Elvis. And it's his last, his last performance, I think. And he died a few weeks later in Memphis um, or Graceland, I guess. And it's really sad. You see that like, even after everything he's gone through, after the the emotional manipulation, he's lost his wife at this point. He's um, He's on his way out. Uh, there's a really horrible line where there's like a newsreel talking in the background as they're kind of preparing you for his final moments. And the the person over the newscast says he, um, oh, torment. So he, he spends weeks in his room tormented by his growing waistline. Yes, I clocked um, that as well. I was like, um, oh, okay. And I, and I actually um, want to go into like how the media treats fat Elvis to use like the colloquial term is how he's referenced but yeah so you see he's obviously gained a lot of weight he actually I googled it um I hope I really hope I don't trigger anyone by saying this uh but he gained so when he, when Elvis died he was 158 kilos um and he gained around 80 kilos in that 10 years of between the comeback special and him dying and uh, after the whole Vegas res- residency so and it mainly being because he was just like in a binge eat cycle, you know, and it's interesting. So I wonder if, if this was to happen now, you know, what? I'm going to say this and I'm instantly going to like say, oh, no, we know exactly what would happen now because we're arseholes. But I was like, oh, if it happened now, like, you know, we'd be a lot more kinder to Elvis because he's clearly got an eating disorder. He's clearly got like an addiction problem. But then we are so horrible to any star who has any kind of weight issue yeah. be it be it they're too thin or they're too fat like they'll just get ridiculed so actually i'm going to eat my own words say no we're because we're arseholes because we feel so entitled to comment on people's weight mm. and i think as well when it comes to male male weight male body image there's not as much of an open dialogue about it and men Agreed. feel a lot of shame I mean I'm not a man so I can't say but mm. I, I imagine men feel a lot of shame about having an eating disorder definitely and about, weight and about you know the, you know anxiety about being too skinny and not kind of fitting into like what they what the image of masculinity that they feel they should be mm. and that is magnified when they're a big star and especially a big star who started off as being a heartthrob and is is meant to you know whose image is kind of meant to appeal to um young women and it's kind of meant to be desirable and we kind of see that deteriorate in the film as kind of mm. as he kind of gains weight as he um um as his kind of health suffers something i found really interesting actually in the film um i think that's one of the only references the line you just read to elvis being fat Mm-hmm. Um, because obviously in our kind of cultural imagination we have an image of Elvis um, as a fat person towards mm-hmm. the end of his life and mm-hmm. there's a lot of kind of you know um, myths about oh he ate you know bacon and peanut butter sandwiches every day or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever it mm-hmm. was but something I found in the film is there's not a lot of focus given to Elvis eating no um, and it's really interesting that what seems to be more of an explanation about his weight loss is more of a complex mix of addiction um, to substances, mm-hmm. um, you know, deteriorating mental health, being in a very controlling, toxic relationship, um, losing significant people in his life, like, you know, his divorce. So basically kind of a mixture of like mental health, trauma and addiction mm-hmm. is kind of what leads him to gain weight. And I thought that was quite different to the kind of cultural narrative that we often have and we often see in you know films and tv which is this person is fat because they eat too much yeah Whereas what we're seeing here is there's a there's a, a real complex set of reasons as to why someone might 
gain weight. Um, I thought that was something something really quite yeah important that the film does it. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I think the only reference I think, and it's the real life footage, um, is at the very end is where he's playing at the piano, playing um, doing Unchained Melody. There are uh, cups of Coke, Coca Cola all yeah. over the piano but that's actually real life footage um and again like if he is I, I i they don't really say what drugs he's on but i'm guessing it's some sort of like methamphetamine that was very popular at the time uh he'll be like craving sugar constantly so it makes sense if he's like leaning on fizzy drinks on sodas um to get him through but you're right there's this idea like <laughs> I talk about it all the time. You can be fat for a number of different reasons. He's also getting older. Our bodies change as we get older. Our metabolism shifts. You know, he cannot be the same weight he was at 42 that he'd be at 22. Now, I'm not saying that completely absolves of why he um he did gain the weight he did gain, but it's also like a realistic thing. We do get bigger as we get older. He's also like performing his ass off. So there's like there's um there's loads of uh montages of um like his different tour outfits when he's going around as uh, going around the states when he's going in his visit, Vegas residency. You see him moving and pumping and dancing and doing like like karate moves. And he's also a very like his whole vibe is he's this very energetic performer, and yet he's still gaining weight because it's not again. It, if it was, it'd be so much easier to be like everyone would be thin, right? If it was as simple as calories, calories out, calories in, calories out, you know, just exercise, burn it off. Clearly, he is burning off, but it's not enough. So something else is obviously going on, which goes back to this idea of like, uh, it's like a cocktail of all these different elements of his life that are falling down. So you've got the drug addiction, you've got the trauma, you've got the grief, you've got the isolation. No, like. It, that's just what happened and I, I think there's there have been talks about how he was a binge eater and again that makes kind of makes sense because binge eating can come from uh well it's a comfort you know binge eating is can be because people are trying to escape lose themselves in food not deal with the issues and this man has issues i don't blame him i mean again at every point of this film i'm just going someone just needs to take control and i, I actually feel for priscilla in that moment because she really does try like you know go to san francisco san francisco go to a rehab get some help but it's it's almost like too far gone at this point yeah i think i think your point is really important that they've made it clear it isn't just because he you know he was eating loads of food it was because of this all this other stuff going on and it, it's a tragedy, right? It's an absolute tragedy what happened to Elvis. And there's a, I think they say at the very beginning when they introduced Tom Parker that he worked Elvis like a mule. Yeah. And it's interesting because we've been saying this whole time Tom Parker has no humanity. He's this caricature of a villain. You know, we who is he? Where actually he removes Elvis's humanity. Mm. So maybe that's where Baz was coming from. Well, he, did, he didn't give Elvis the grace to treat him as a human. So in this biopic, I'm not going to give him the grace to treat him as a human. Yes, I love that idea. Yeah, com I can completely see that because, you know, yeah, as, as the film progresses and as, um, as, as the Colonel gets more kind of control over Elvis' life, like in the kind of Vegas residency years, Mm. Elvis is just like a shell of himself. I he, know. He's um he's you know barely lucid. Mm. He's kind of you know taking a cocktail of drugs. He's doing these really high octane performances that are physically mm. exhausting. He's living in isolation. Um, he's isolated from his family. Um, I've got to say as well the when he does those performances, the may I was so struck by the makeup. The makeup is incredible mm -hmm. in terms of like portraying how kind of physically exhausting they are yeah yeah well again it's this it's interesting because um in a, a film shorthand to show that someone's unfit is to make them super sweaty well yeah yeah right and and i think throughout the entirety of the vegas residency scenes elvis is super super sweaty mm. and again it's interesting because you're meant to sweat but because because we have been 
conditioned to view sweat especially like um, excessive sweat as a sign of unfitness so say for example you've heard you've heard and I can't think of an example but I know you'll have heard in film or tv when someone has come off um you know I've just done a five mile run and they look pristine and it's this idea that they're so fit like it barely bothered them or they're just glowing but then you'll have another character next to them who's out of breath <sighs> you know super sweaty and that's to show that they're very unfit and it's usually it's a joke and I don't know why but I can imagine this happening in Big Bang Theory <laughs> like I can imagine Penny went for a run and was absolutely fine with it and Leonard was struggling that that's like something that happened in that show I'm sure and this is what this film is doing with this one like oh we show him really really sweaty because he's unfit he's out of practice and and uh he's gaining weight right the thing is I think to your point, when you said, oh, I didn't know much about Elvis apart from what pop culture has told me, which are, which are basically uh, memes of fat Elvis who ate a sub but died on the toilet. Um, there's Again, there's a rumour that he died from um, in, uh, constipation. That's it. That he died from constipation. That is the rumour, which is not true. <laughs> he died from a heart attack. Um, so all these things are happening to feed into this, uh, into your idea of who Elvis was, which is this unfit, washed up man. And I do think the film does a really good job of showing you it's so much more nuanced and complex with that. They don't even allude to the rumours around his death, which I really appreciate. And I actually really appreciate how they end it because it kind of ends on a high in terms of like he gave the performance of his life and that final one we see and we get to see Austin and real life Elvis do it. What's interesting is a few years before Elvis died, Cass Elliot, who was uh, Mama Cass from the Mamas and Papas, mm -hmm. she um, died. And the rumors around her, because she was a bigger woman, uh, yeah, she hated she hated the nickname Mama Cass, which I just find really sad now because that's how everyone refers to her even now. Um, but she, when she died, uh, the rumor was she died with a ham sandwich in her mouth because, of course, yes, I've heard that as well. Yeah. Yes, and it's this idea that even in death, these fat people are completely stripped of their humanity of their dignity like almost like well what do you expect because you've it's almost like you've eaten yourself into an early grave now as a fat person I have been told that many times it's nasty it's it's so cruel and I think going back to this idea that Elvis can't defend himself yeah. Cass Elliot can't defend themselves because they've passed and all these rumors get brought up about them just sent it centers their fatness and it centers their morality yeah yeah certainly i think when someone dies young like elvis or mother Cass, um and they die as a fat person i yeah. think that creates this quite negative myth around them and also potentially i think the case with elvis maybe affects the way that their music is received definitely i wonder if i mean if there's i mean there's loads there's kind of numerous um male musicians who died young and are seen as yeah. icons so yeah. like you know Kirk Cobain, John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, um, Jim Morrison etc and Elvis died young as well you know he was only 42 okay mm. he was a little bit older than those guys mm -hmm. but they all they're all kind of musical icons legends and they all died young but the difference between those four that I just mentioned yeah. is that they died you know, young and thin and beautiful. I was going to say, yeah. They didn't die fat and they didn't die on the toilet, which is, or, you know, allegedly on the toilet, which is mm -hmm. considered to be sort of, you know, embarrassing or linked to kind of something yes. like grotesque. Yes. And so I think, you know, those icons are, you know, they're remembered as being kind of, you know, we kind of see young pictures of them circulating in pop culture, whereas with Elvis, we often see the kind of fat version of him. And then... You know, it's it's it seemed to be kind of cool to listen to um, Kirk Bain or to listen to like The Doors or whoever. Hmm. But it's not. Is it cool to listen to Elvis? I think you know. I think Elvis is. I mean, my my perception, you know, kind of growing up was that Elvis was seen as a bit kind of cheesy mm. to listen to, or that kind of he was more associated with kind of I guess an older audience who might like country and western. Like I don't think that he's has the same kind of reception as like being this kind of cool artist that those guys are seen as being and I wonder if that's linked to the manner of his death 
Oh, I think you're so spot on here. There's a phrase or there's a quote. I'm 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 referencing the office again, but one of the characters, Stanley, says, live fast, die young, leave a sexy corpse. Yes, that's it, isn't it? It's that that's one hundred percent it. And you know, Elvis doesn't fit into that narrative of having like the sexy corpse. Exactly. It's kind of affected the way that we see him in our imagination, but also he, the way that he's re- his, maybe it's the way that his music's received as well. Yeah, he he his our lasting memory is of this larger, um, cheesy costumed, and I say that with absolute love because the costumes are amazing. The costume design of this film is absolutely brilliant i the, I, I read that they i think they made like something like 900 costumes wow. for 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 elvis i think have i made that up I, I might have to do like a little edit where i like correct myself um but yeah like they are awesome but i guess they have never been um coolified they've never been brought back in a cool way apart from you know if if someone was to dress up as elvis for say halloween they're going to wear the white jumpsuit with the cape aren't they but then what i really liked about how we see elvis from the very beginning he has like he's always had style um it's just it was you know very rockabilly in the 50s going in into the 60s he has that comeback special he has that like black leather jumpsuit on that's so that's so sexy that's mm-hmm. so cool and yet that isn't the lasting memory the lasting memory was is of fat elvis and if he i i, I hate to like you know uh will to cut his life short but say if he died in the 60s maybe if he died just after that that really popular tv special would we be having a very different conversation right now would we be would he be revered and i think that with um michael jackson i can't help but like comp- compare the two because what michael jackson was 50 when he died he died in a very opposite circumstance in terms of like body size where he was incredibly frail but addiction uh, he was on prescription drugs he had a doctor who was um giving him like things he absolutely shouldn't be giving him very similar to elvis's dr nick who he did get struck off the medical board yeah. i think in the 90s in the end he was absolved of wrongdoing but he did get his license removed um but still it's the same idea like you know they keep they keep these artists um drug induced so they can make them more malleable make them easier to control and you know if you if you've watched um Michael Jackson's This Is It, where he's preparing for his um, O2 residency. Another residency. Oh, my God, the parallels. Um, <laughs> uh, you can see he is in 100%. He is in incredibly frail condition. Um, there's a, obviously, like, Michael Jackson's image has been commented on uh, for f- forever and a day. But if he, and again, I don't mean to cut Michael Jackson's life short, but say if he died before the plastic surgery before obviously the allegations that were made about him um would we look back at michael jackson differently i don't i mean we'll never know but i would think absolutely yes because i think even now people are a bit cautious to say that they're a michael jackson fan and that leads to this idea because you always hear and you hear this about elvis oh they were so good looking when they were younger yeah but then when you look back at like like you mentioned uh kurt cobain I'm, i'm thinking of um what was the guy from T-Rex called? Mark, Mark, Mark Bolin. Mark Bolin. Yeah. Like, they always go, oh, my God, so hot. So hot. I'm like, yeah, they died young. If you saw them now, you probably would think they were hot because they're older. And we're so, we were so ageist. Yeah, completely. I think when it comes to icons, we sort of don't want them to age and we don't want them to die. And we don't want them to get fat. We don't want them to change shape. And yeah. when they do, it's kind of difficult for us to process. And then that's where the kind of shaming comes in and then mm. where the kind of narratives of like, um, and the kind of myths that kind of taint our sort of memory of them. But yeah, you know, all of these, you know, all of these musicians that died, that died young, um, they died young and sexy and, that, and that's, that's the only image we have of them. But mm. if we have other images of them, then I think it's difficult for us to kind of, always to kind of relate back to like oh they were they they were they were young at one point but I think yeah I think the kind of the youth gets tainted in some way and I think as a culture I think we have an issue with like yeah I think with kind of aging with kind of bodies changing 
um, especially when they're celebrities and especially when they're meant to be kind of you know heartthrobs as well yeah do you think it's related to money because is there a sense of like well you're famous you have money therefore you can afford to stay young you can afford the plastic surgery the botox the ivy treatments the the personal trainers the personal chefs so you should look younger forever your body should stay the same because you can afford to do that and then when inevitably their bodies change because they're aging humans again it's this idea like do we not even think of them as real people Mm. and 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 (laughs) I guess you know we have been told we should be aspiring to be these celebrities and then when they don't uphold the beauty standard we hold it against them yeah yeah I think it could be potentially to do with money because you know I guess um people like Elvis and you know big kind of celebrities big musicians have more money than the average person Mm. so I guess it's very easy for the average person to say well you know why don't you just get cosmetic surgery why don't you just kind of pay for an expensive gym or what have you but yeah I think we do you know we do forget that they're um they are real people and they have Mm -hmm. you know mental health struggles they have physical health struggles um and I think you know in in our kind of like capitalist society in general I think we are so obsessed with personal responsibility for like everything about yourself like Mm. you are personally responsible for your for your body image, for your weight, for your success. And actually sometimes there are kind of other factors at play. And then that's what makes people get kind of shamed for things. It's the idea that they've kind of failed to be kind of productive and to kind of take personal responsibility for their, for their health. I think, yeah, I think it's also that idea that like in, in, you know, society, we have this image of like, if someone's fat, it means they are ill or they're Mm -hmm. kind of like ailing in some way and then kind of, therefore closer to death um and yeah I think that kind of is it's kind of going on in this film as well yes definitely and you hear that with um again we hear it very briefly with the, the newcaster but there's this idea that like Elvis is reaching the end of his road just before it actually happens and I mean I'd love to do a bit more research into like how the actual media did treat Elvis as he gained weight I can only imagine it was horrendously um because it's horrendous now so why would it not be horrendous in the 70s but there is this idea that yeah he's he's uh I hate this phrase but he's let himself go and he's he's okay with the idea of dying and the thing is like say 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 if that's true Say, say if Elvis was comfortable with the idea that he was going to die the way he was living his life and that's not to do with food that's like the addiction that's the constant performing that's you know I guess the uppers and downers the alcohol all that kind of stuff would not it's not a healthy lifestyle but if he was okay with dying at the age of 42 that's clearly a mental health issue you know he's clearly depressed but they talk it as if like oh it's completely like satisfactory that he's 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 killing himself in this situation and again i wonder if they did view it as him killing himself it's like a very slow killing himself it's a very slow suicide but it's definitely of of that ilk going back to the idea of like taking personal responsibility for your health and 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 and, and ergo your weight because we as a society view them as synonymous with each other i think that that is like elvis to a point if Elvis could afford the best doctors, the best health care, the best diet, the best personal chefs, and yet he still looks the way he looks, well, then that's on him. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you've be, you've been given all this privilege to resolve your issues in the way that your average, your average Joe can't. Oh, well, then you deserve the fate you're given. It's the same with me, like, because I'm not actively on a diet, because I'm not actively trying to lose weight, because that's not good for me from a mental health point of view, I must be totally okay with the idea of getting ill, which, of course, I'm not. I don't want to be ill. Like, I'm a healthy person. I try to stay healthy. I go to the doctors for my ailments if I have them, like anyone else. But because I'm not actively trying to lose weight, I must be, like 
okay with the idea of that I might be heading towards an early grave, which is not true, but this is the idea, right? This is this idea of I have let myself go, therefore I must accept the early fate that must befall me because that's how it all works. I've had people comment on my shit saying like, you don't see fat 80 year olds. And I'm like, <laughs> have you just not left the house? <laughs> Cause you absolutely <laughs> do. Yeah. Like, again, it's just, it's just myths that we've told each other to make ourselves feel better, feel morally superior because you have a faster metabolism than me. Oh, well done you. Like that's not, <laughs> that's just a fact. Like my genetics has set the pattern for why I am the size I am, but it doesn't mean that like I must be heading towards ill health, but yet we cannot distinguish between the two because films like this, no, that's not fair. Films like this, because we said Elvis has a good, 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 smart portrayal of fatness, but other films definitely <laughs> go, well, because you're fat, this must mean that you're going to die young and therefore that's okay. Yes, definitely. It's so complex. And yeah, I think there's, yeah, there's kind of like a myth and a sort of narrative that's like perpetuated in film and TV as well, that like, oh, this is just the individual's fault and it's their choice. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as you just said, it's kind of like a whole complex like network of factors that even kind of goes down to like genetics. It's, you know, it's, it's mental health, it's physical health. Yeah. All sorts. Um, but I was thinking while you were talking, actually, that like, even when, when, where celebrities are concerned with both I think aging and weight loss if they do appear to kind of um, obviously be working on themselves and it's obvious that they're doing that like if they've had cosmetic surgery if they're seen out running they're also shamed for that yes um, so they, oh so they can't perfect win. no 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 they can't that's actually the same because I remember this is a while ago um but Nike uh, commissioned like plus size mannequins to show off their plus size uh, fitness athletic range and um, it got absolutely destroyed on Twitter and it, I think it was an article in the Telegraph or the Guardian one of the two um, going like um, Nike's promoting a uh, unhealthy lifestyle and then all the plus size people went yeah but we can't win mm -hmm. you tell us we need to work out you need to give us clothes to work out in this is a this is a brand giving us clothes to work out in and then you're slacking them off for giving us the clothes that you want us to work out in so we could lose the weight so we could look like how you want us to look you cannot win and that is why I've come to the wise old age of 31 and realize there's no point arguing with these people like all I can do is live my life for me you know the thing is I was going to say as long as I'm healthy I don't even owe anyone that because what is health right just be say say for example I had some kind of ailment I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head say I had asthma right so that could be something that would make mean that I am unhealthy but that doesn't mean I don't deserve respect that doesn't yeah. mean I don't deserve dignity so this idea of like because again I see this <laughs> on my socials well as long as you're healthy why 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 is that why is that the the threshold for whether or not you treat me like a human yeah. that you don't bully me is yeah. if I give you my health report card and it comes back all clean mm. i don't owe you that i don't owe you that yeah. i think again it's it's going back to the idea of like um you know this person needs to be healthy or they are you know having or their lifestyle is kind of like working in a way that is kind of leading them to like a premature death or this person doesn't doesn't care about themselves or doesn't respect themselves yeah because they are this image or this size or whatever it's like oh well they you know you have to kind of like be healthy in order to like um be seen to be respecting yourself in a way yeah That's like the narrative it seems yeah but then but the like to your point that portrayal of respecting oneself is so narrow yeah yeah definitely so you have to fit what it what society has deemed respecting yourself because I respect myself. I love the fuck out of myself. I've I've worked really hard to get to where I am and I'm not letting go of it. But that to me is respecting myself. But to, you know, troll person on the internet, that wouldn't be. Yeah. And therefore, like, so it's just, I mean, again, it's, it's entitlement. It's privilege. 
and it's also like honestly like it's just pure projection and bullying and it does piss me off and i think go, just bring it back to this film for a second i think in that point this is where the film kind of doesn't work narratively where they treat quote unquote fat elvis i don't mean to say it as a as a, as a slur but with fat elvis I think the film treats him with respect and again like paints this picture of why he might have got to where he got to and again he has death in his dignity where they show you know they they could have easily have shown him the way they show Tom Tom Parker collapsing in yeah. in a room or wherever it is and then whisked off to the hospital and then we die no no the his final shots of the film are hit that amazing performance which we keep coming back to whereas with Tom Parker they are the opposite in terms of respect and dignity in terms of his body size and body shape by putting him in this grotesque fat suit so it's almost like talking at both sides of its mouth yes yes because you know as much as we want to um celebrate elvis and show you know and you, you know kind of challenge those kind of quite negative myths that we have around him and show how like incredible he was as an artist and also you know like someone who's very like politically engaged and all of this kind of stuff yeah that was very interesting yeah, like as much as the film, I think, does a really good job of that, it doesn't make that, you know, it doesn't make it okay to kind of portray the villain who is also a fat person and was in real life in such a negative way. Mm. It kind of reminds me of, you know, when like a guy will uh, try and compliment one girl by insulting another girl. It's kind of like, <laughs> that's what the film's doing. Oh my God, it's like that. It's like, it's like, so you're not like the other girls. Yeah. Is. Elvis is not like the other fat men. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so true. And actually, kind of going back to your representation for a second, because you said, oh, we don't see many shots of Elvis eating, if any at all. Do we see any shots of Tom Parker eating? That's a really good point, because I don't think we do either. I can't um, think off the top of my head. Yeah. He is. He does always have a cigar, and that apparently is true. He did always have a cigar, and I'm just thinking from a, a place of health. You know, we see, well, rightly, smoking is bad for your health, and the fact that he has a cigar kind of contributes to that. Um, but I don't think we see him eating. But yes, very interesting. I just wanted to kind of round this off. Um, I did a quick um, Google to see whether or not Tom Parker had been portrayed in the media before this film. So there was a mini mini series in 2005 on Elvis and it had Jonathan Rhys Myers as Elvis and it had Randy Quaid as Colonel Tom Parker. Now Randy Quaid has always been a bit of a bigger guy and from what I could tell um there's very little about this mini series I should point out. Um, Jonathan Rhys Myers did win a Golden Globe for his performance and he was nominated for X amount of Emmys, like I think eight Emmys, but I never heard of it until I <laughs> researched it. Um, but it looks like Randy Quaid is not in a fat suit for his portrayal, but I could be wrong there. It, it's very hard to see slash tell. And then the other portrayal was in 2016. There was a, a, a short show. No, it's a, sorry, it's a film. It's a film called Shangri-La Suite from 2016. And John Carroll Lynch plays Colonel Tom Parker in that. Um, and again, he's quite a big man. So I, I, I again, I can't find anything. I don't think anyone saw this film. I've never heard of it before in my life. I can't see whether or not he's in a fat suit, but he's already a bigger guy. So this kind of comes back to that representation where they, were, they actually just cast men who already had a similar body shape to portray the fat Tom, Colonel Tom Parker. So that kind of works. And I'm not mad at that. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't aware that there'd been other narratives about him. Um, and it's really interesting that those ones have cast people with appropriate body shapes. Yeah. And totally. Wonder, do you think that might be because they're kind of like, like smaller projects, like smaller films, smaller TV shows? Yeah. Well, I would also say like they're absolutely possibly that, but also Randy Quaid and John Carroll Lynch are both character actors. Mm. So like they're not, I mean, for me, I would watch anything John Carroll Lynch is in because I love, but they aren't the big name pool that tom hanks is yeah. where tom hanks is an absolute a-list celebrity actor so i think i think there's a bit of both at play there's there's 
potentially the smaller smaller productions don't have the budget to pay for the makeup artistry that goes into a fat suit and also it's not as essential that they are bigger names because they are smaller projects are going to be on tv that film um the shangri-la suites has like emily browning in it so that's the only name i recognized it obviously was a wide release film so maybe it wasn't as essential that it was a bigger name in that role whereas for elvis they must have been going back to what I said at the beginning, they didn't even want to make this film for years because it was just stuck in this development turmoil until Tom Hanks signed on. He was the reason this got made. Yeah. So I think it's essential to the film's existence that Tom Hanks is in it, but I think it is it's to its detriment. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I think, you know, as we both said as Baz Luhrmann fans, yeah. we watch the hell out of this film still if it had a lesser known actor in who was actually a fat a fat actor and was playing a fat character. Oh my god, like I cannot tell you how much more interested I would be in this film. Because I guess this is one of the reasons why like I, I've brought I've brought forward the Batman and the Whale because they were also nominated for best makeup at the Oscars the same year that Elvis was. So we had three out of the five nominations nominated for Best Makeup for Fat Suits, which really sits wrong with me. Um and there's a reason why I haven't done the whale yet. Batman's on the list. I've seen it. It's, well, I don't care. I don't care. I love I'm an R Pat's gal till I die, but that film was boring. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah there's 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 I'm just struck with this decision it's its representation is bizarre to me and i think i don't know how i don't know how brenner fraser's character is portrayed in the world i haven't seen it yet but obviously like he's meant to be the lead so he's not the villain if there is a villain it might be a film that you know doesn't really need a villain or maybe he's his own villain oh i bet that's it have you seen it i have yes oh okay am i right or wrong um it's kind of there is a villain that's kind of like off screen. Oh, okay. But like it's kind of like someone who or people who are kind of never really uh, that, that they don't come into the they're not portrayed as characters, but they're sort of like mm. referred to. And then something bad happens that tries to explain why he gained the weight. Mm. Um, so there is a kind of villain, but the sort of the kind of the impact of that is very much kind of like on. Brendan Fraser's character and kind of gaining all this weight mm. that means he is allegedly a week from death oh shit oh god oh god I'm gonna hate this film <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, and that's um, so, it's, it's such a shame watch. because I love Brendan Fraser my whole entire being and I'm so happy he's back after the fucking shit he's been through but my why this film why this film yeah. no I know <sighs> But just going back to the make the makeup. Yeah, yeah, please. I wonder if um, that's got to do with how we kind of celebrate actors who kind of transform in certain ways. Ah, uh, um, yeah. And it's often it's often kind of male actors as well. I mm-hmm. could be wrong here, but I think when male actors transform in their role, whether it's through prosthetics, a fat suit, or they put on weight or they gain weight, they're seen as these kind of brilliant artists. But when it's a, a female actor who has to do that it's like so and so is unrecognizable or so and so had to put on massive amounts of weight and it's like mm-hmm. two stone or you know it's something like yeah I yeah mean, Renee Zellweger definitely is the kind of is the person I'm thinking of but also, yeah you know potentially like Margot Robbie as well when mm-hmm. I think she was in Mary Queen of Scots and mm-hmm. she just had like a, a bald cap and wig on that meant she had like a high hairline and people were like Oh, isn't it incredible that you know she can uglify herself? Like, it's just, well, like but this is what uh, actors do. Like, <laughs> same for Margot Robbie and Itonia. That was yeah, a yeah. massive part of the the pool for that film. Was like, oh my god, like one of the most beautiful women anyone has ever seen with their own eyes has made themselves ugly poor tanya harding can i just point out like yeah. being called yeah. by every publication going that you are absolutely ugly like oh no but you're totally right and actually i think from a booking point of view like margot robbie's um agent i totally understand because she was so like and rightly so she's 
absolutely stunning but she obviously is a good actress and it was being hindered by her beauty so they've purposely started putting her in roles where she has to uglify herself but then that becomes the whole premise of the publicity and it's just like just let these people act you know again I, I to your point between male and female actors I think it's this idea where like um we just put women on such a pedestal that they should always be beautiful and the fact that they would even dare to let a few cameras film them being ugly is oh my god well you know credit where credit's due like they're just acting like not taking away from their skill at all not at all but if you're going to do it at least make it equal and I think you're right. As much as I think Renee Zellweger is phenomenal in Bridget Jones's Diary, I think one of the reasons why she gets a very rare comedy nomination for Best Actress that year is because of her weight gain. Mm, I think yeah. it, I think they went, oh, you had, you had to put on 20 pounds. Mm. You, you you know, we've got to give, got to give you an Oscar for that. But she got nominated and didn't win. Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely some misogyny going on here because again i mean christian bale he's one of the the actors i always go back to who constantly is gaining and losing extreme amounts of weight i mean ultimately his body can do what he wants i'm not i'm not saying he shouldn't but it is painted by the media as something that should be applauded and something that should be respected because it's like dedication to the craft Mm. where there are so many studies about the effect that yo-yo dieting has and this like massive um body weight um escalation de-escalation like what that does to your internal organs organs is not good and i i mean the man's getting old as well so his like his i say old (laughs) oh I have some ages, I'm right there. He must be low, like 40 something. <laughs> older. He's getting yeah, older. Yeah. His metabolism will not be what it used to be. So he needs to just chill out. That's yeah. my medical advice that he has asked me for <laughs> from a non doctor. You need to chill out, mate. <laughs> right. So, Harry, is there anything else you wanted to cover? Um, I think we've we've dissected the film quite quite well we we talked about all sorts um yeah so no I think I think I think we're good good I think the one thing we didn't mention and I have purposely avoided it is um the uh, accusation of cultural appropriation by Elvis to to the black community I'm a white person I don't feel I'm in a place where I can talk about it but what I would say there's a really good line where it's where Elvis meets little Richard in Club Handy and he's singing Tutti Frutti and he says, oh, I really want to record that. And I think it's B.B. King who says, well, if you did, you'd make much more money than he would. And I was like, facts, absolute mm. facts. Yeah, yeah, I think the film does concisely like demonstrate in that moment that there's, you know, there's an unequal social status between like white and black artists at that at that point in time Mm -hmm. um and as much as I would have loved the film to kind of dig more into that and maybe you know maybe a future feature film will dig more into that and Mm -hmm. I'd love to see a film deal with that in more detail I think the film is covering so much ground yes it just has to kind of gloss over it a little bit but yes that piece of dialogue is is quite important and does kind of concisely Mm -hmm. convey what is going on there Mm-hmm. yeah agreed i think this film has a runtime of like two and a half hours which it's long mm. and that's again one of the criticisms i saw was was the length of the film so i agree i think where it's it's trying to already do a lot it could have absolutely given more time to it but its central argument was always going to be around elvis and colonel tom parker so some things have to fall by the wayside is it the right thing i don't know um, but it is a fair criticism. So, Harriet, on Facts on Film, we like to rate our films based on how well we believe they represent fat and larger bodies or just general body di- diversity. And we like to rate them out of ourselves. So out of the five potential Harriets, what will you give Elvis for fat representation? Oh, this is kind of tricky because I think if we look at Tom Parker, it's just not good. Mm-hmm. Like overall, it's 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 not great. But if we look at Elvis, I think it is quite sympathetic. 
and mm-hmm. it's kind of showing us things that we maybe don't we haven't seen you know about elvis in wider pop culture and about you know fat representation in general like you know someone becoming fat rather than just trying to lose weight or mm. you know how um complex um putting on weight can be beyond just mm. kind of like this person is eating too much so i'm gonna i'm gonna say oh i'm gonna go three three stars three harriets three harriets <laughs> well i echo everything you've said um i think as well to the film's credit the fact it waits until the final possible scene with Austin Butler to put him in the fat suit is good. I think it's positive. Again, I, I read something that he really wanted the makeup to be um, simple uh, as, as he ages. So they give him, I think they, they kind of uh, want to keep his face quite round when he's younger. To, uh, so it's quite youthful. And as he obviously gets older, he gets more chiseled. And that's when like the cheek, the kind of cheek implants come in or the cheek prosthetics come in. And then ultimately we get um, a, a more pronounced fat suit view of him. And I, I think that is very good. I, I like that. It means it's not a mockery of quote unquote fat Elvis. It's done in more in a in in the most respectful way. Like they've not shied away from it because we knew it was coming. We knew we were going to see the fat Elvis look, but I think they're very kind with it. But I think Colonel Tom Parker's representation, the fat suit, Tom Hanks's performance, all really is this cocktail of and this is a scientific term, trash. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I really think it's trash. Uh, I think it's one of the worst things I've seen Tom Hanks in. I'm not even the biggest Tom Hanks fan. Um, like I'm, I'm, I'm just an average, average, average fan, I would say. But this is by far the worst thing I think I've seen him in. I'm shocked. He was, he won the Razzie for worst supporting actor this year. Really? Um, well. Uh, well earned well earned. <laughs> well earned well done tom um yeah it's it's really bad and i think it's it's callous and cruel and i uh, to give baz a little bit of credit i understand why he did it because he has a very clear point of view where he's coming from i understand it but i think he lost sight of the humanity i really really do and i think tom's actions are are evil enough just let it let the story be told through his actions alone you don't need this extra fluff going on personally so for that i'm actually going to give it to hannah's uh just because i'm so disgusted by the fat suit in this film <laughs> but but i think your point of view around how elvis's fatness is not explained but well, maybe it is explained, his fa- his, or, or could be explained, or at least, you know, some thoughts to why why he gained the weight he did. I think that's a really valid point, and th- thank you for bringing that to, to my attention and to the listeners' attention. So that is three Harriets, and that is two Hannahs for 2022's Elvis. We did it. <laughs> we spoke a lot about Elvis. I say like we spoke a lot about Elvis as in like the pop culture and then we spoke about Elvis as in the film. Like, I think it's always going to happen with this one yeah. because it's it, you can, because it's a biopic you have to talk about both both examples. So thank you so much Harriet for like being my co-pilot through this one. Can you please let the lovely listeners know where they can find you and more of your work? Yes, um, mostly on Twitter. So on Twitter, you can find me at Dr. Harriet Fletch. And then there's a link to my link tree where you can read some articles I've written for Ghouls and elsewhere too. Awesome. Thank you so much. And and, and the links to Harriet's works will be in the show notes. So you can just go there it's for a quick, easy access. And listeners can find the podcast at Fats on Film on Twitter and Instagram and myself at Queen B Says on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. And I'll see you at the next one. And stay fat.